Uh, my name is Tamara Louie. I'm currently a data scientist at Pinterest in San Francisco. And today I'm going to be giving a tutorial on applying statistical modeling and machine learning to perform time series forecasting. Um, so first things first, um, if you want to follow along with this tutorial presentation, um, the Google Slides version is available here in this link. Um, I'm not sure if the uh, conference also provided you with the PDF version, but if you want to follow along with my slides, um, feel free to enter in the link above um, and just follow along. Um, so I'll give folks like five seconds to take a look at that or take a picture. Okay, cool. Let me know if you didn't get it and I'll go back. Um, so overall, for time series forecasting, I'm going to give some background and context from my perspective on how you apply statistical and machine learning models for time series forecasting. Um, we're going to go through a toy example and do just some general data due diligence that I do with any um, modeling or even data analysis task, um, specifically for time series forecasting. We'll do a lot of analysis into time series data and what are some just sort of standard things we tend to look at from a statistical and data perspective when looking at time series data and how this is different from regular modeling problems. Um, and lastly, we'll actually get to some modeling of time series data using some statistical and machine learning models. It's not comprehensive, but it's a small sample of them. Um, so some notes before we begin. Um, I know it's a large group, but please let me know if you want to go more or less in depth into a particular subject. Um, this is really for you guys, and I know everyone here comes from a different baseline and a different background of their familiarity with data, with Python, with time series data, with modeling. Um, so please feel free to stop me and ask any clarifying questions um, about any of the things I'm about to present. Um, so to give some background and context, um, why is forecasting important? Like in industry or even in academia, when would you do for time series forecasting? Um, and what are some applications? Um, I've actually seen quite a few applications in many fields, um, both in academia and industry, um, since I've started. Um, and I think it's actually become much more prominent in sort of the public discourse on what a forecast means. Um, there's lots of applications in politics. Um, so 538 is a popularized um, statistics and data visualization journalism blog um, that every day or every so often they output political forecasts for upcoming seats, elections, etc. Um, and I think they've really popularized um, how to explain forecast to the general public and what does uncertainty mean in a forecast when predicting things like this. Um, other examples that are classically used are in finance or economics. Um, so in a lot of um, financial jobs, from analysts to data scientists to researchers, um, time series data is quite important. Oftentimes, you're trying to predict something like the predicted price of a fund or a stock. Um, and time series data often lends very valuable information into imputing future values of a stock. Um, so one example is you'll see a lot of analysts will use the Bloomberg terminal, and they'll just have many time series um, data of various uh, monetary assets that they track almost every day. Um, and then the last major example I've encountered is in healthcare. Um, so a lot of my background is in healthcare. So I actually worked um, on mainly flu forecasting. Um, but there's a lot of applications of forecasting within healthcare. Um, there's a lot of actuarial examples, such as um, expected life expectancy of the US population every year. Um, what's the probability you're going to have a heart attack in the next 50 years? A lot of these involve time series methods, and there's a lot of very good applications in healthcare as well. Um, so what are some things that you may learn in this tutorial, or I'm hoping you may learn? Um, I'm hoping to explain a little bit about why time series data is different from your regular data task, and why that may be. Um, how to process or do some simplistic processing of time series data um, in preparation for analysis and modeling how to better understand it, um, apply statistical and machine learning methods to time series problems. Um, I think that there are some differences between applying sort of more classic statistical or machine learning models versus models specifically tailored for time series data. Um, understand some strengths and weaknesses of these models, and also just generally how to evaluate, interpret, and convey output from forecasting methods. 
Um, so hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to take your own time series data that you can find, apply some of these methods, and create your own models and predictions yourself. Um, so I didn't include this in the sort of precursor email, but um, generally what you'll need for this tutorial um, is I'm actually using Collaboratory, which is a Jupyter-like or IPython notebook-like environment created by Google and open sourced by Google. Um, so all it requires is access to Chrome or Firefox and access to a Google account. Um, that's my preferred method of sort of implementing the code in this tutorial. Alternatively, I have the IPython notebook, which I'm using in my GitHub environment that I'll have available for you to download if you want to work on this in your own Python environment. Um, in terms of methodologies um, that is sort of the baseline for this, um, I'm assuming familiarity with basic data-related Python packages, such as NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and DateTime. Um, and even if you're not perfectly familiar with um, exactly what I'm implementing or these packages, um, it's fine. We can go through them. And I think the biggest one is sort of a basic knowledge of statistical modeling and machine learning. Um, this is like a big statement, and a lot of people have different levels of expertise on this. Um, I would say that I'm not going to be covering the basics of what is a statistical model, what is a machine learning model. Um, if you have like, basic questions about those, please feel free to ask me. Um, but I'm going to assume that folks already have some knowledge. Um, if you don't, that's totally fine. Um, we'll just try to go through it as we go along. Um, so who am I? Why am I teaching this tutorial? Um, so my name's Tamara. Um, I currently work at Pinterest as a data scientist. Um, my background is actually in healthcare. Um, so I completed my graduate degree in biostatistics at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, where my work was mainly focused around um, trying to predict flu trends in the US, specifically flu forecasting in the US. Um, and I was looking at using a combination or variations of mechanistic versus machine learning models for flu forecasting in the US, uh, which is what my thesis was on. Um, and then I worked with one of my co-advisors um, to publish a paper on combining digital health or electronic health record data in combination with machine learning models for um, flu forecasting in the US. Um, so if you have questions about um, like forecasting in healthcare or what exactly I did, um, please feel free to ask me. Um, then from there, um, I worked at as an intern at Legendary Entertainment, which is a big um, entertainment production company, where I worked in their data science team um, just as an intern to do fun research projects. Um, so I got to implement sequence models, um, looking at using Twitter data um, to do natural language processing to understand are there certain ways we can use sequence model to better understand or predict things in Twitter data. Um, and at Twitter, um, where I had my full-time job as a data scientist was really where I got into time series forecasting more heavily. Um, I, my job there was to predict what Twitter's revenue would be every quarter or every year, which is a very difficult task if you know Twitter. Um, and so that was a really interesting problem space. Um, and I got to learn a lot about what are some limits of applying time series models in industries with real life industry um, applications and industry implications. Um, so if you have any questions about what it's like to implement forecasting models in industry or specifically in like a social media B2C industry, happy to answer those questions. And lastly is I started at Pinterest about a year and a half ago. Um, I actually work on a lot of other things now. Um, so I work mainly with some of the consumer side uh, machine learning and recommendation teams. Um, so I'm not doing as much forecasting, but I still do some forecasting works um, because we're still a relatively small company. And so they sort of need all the help they can get. Um, so I'm not doing as much of that now, but um, I'm doing other fun work that I enjoy. Um, so I'm going to go over um, some data due diligence that I just thought about when I was looking at this data. Um, this section, if people feel like I should go faster or slower, let me know. These are just sort of basic things I tend to look at um, whenever I look at data and time series data. Um, but they're pretty basic steps. So I start, tend to start off with what question do I want to answer? Um, I think it's really important to start with a very concrete question that you think can be answered with data, and specifically that can only be answered with time series data. Otherwise, you'll be wasting a lot of time and effort to research time series models and all of the intricacies with them. And if that can be sufficiently answered with readily available data that's not time series based, um, that's an important assumption to test. 
Um, so some examples of questions I thought that could be answered with forecasting um, is, um, can I predict the expected voter turnout for California for the 2018 midterm elections? Um, I think that would be a really interesting question based on past voter turnout. Um, what is the future expected price of Apple stock over the next year? Um, that's like a very classic um, industry finance time series question. Um, and what is the expected life expectancy of the average US female in 50 years? Um, these things are extremely specific. I already have an idea of the type of data that I could try to find. And I already have an idea of the type of models or analysis I would want to do to answer these. Um, and just to take a step back, um, what is time series data? Do I need time series data to answer this question? Um, a lot of the times people just sort of skip straight to the model or the coolest model, but mm -hmm. it sort of begs the question, like, um, do we even need to implement the most complicated model or do we need to have the most difficult and noisy data we can obtain? Um, sometimes not. But um, for time series data, um, it's defined in a lot of different ways. Um, I tend to describe it as data collected on the same metric or the same object at regular or irregular time intervals um, over time. So if you think about it, like all the data that you collect is just one instance of um, that data occurring in that certain metric measured at that certain time. Really all of the data that we tend to work with is time series data. We just don't treat it that way because we believe that there's no time dependence or we choose to ignore the time dependence of that data. Um, time series um, data and models typically believe that there is some time dependence to how our data is generated. And so um, whenever you're doing a modeling problem, I highly um, suggest looking at like the, the time period over which the data was collected, the time period over which it was trained, because that often has highly biasing effects towards what your outcomes of your models may be. Um, yeah, so I tend to think about um, whether there's really an inherent relationship or structure between my data at various time points. Um, is there a time dependence? Um, and whether we can really leverage that time-ordered information. Um, if there's no real value, I believe, in uh, gathering uh, regular uh, data at regular intervals from this, um, then it's not really worth my time to pursue time series data. Um, so how do we get some time series data? Um, that's sort of the first thing I was thinking about when I'm like, where am I going to get some time series data for this talk? Um, I think it's pretty important because I have a question, but, but say I can't even tackle this if the data is not available. Um, I tend to choose questions um, for like personal or public consumption where there's available data or the capability to create the data myself easily. Um, for me, for this example, I'm going to be using data from this link, um, which I'll provide later, which appears to be publicly available data from Airbnb aggregated in some way. Um, but before I figure out how to ingest this data, I first want to just sort of read some basic things about this data and understand if it is what I want and fulfill some basic requirements about data quality. Um, so how is this data generated? Um, one really nice thing about being at, um, like, at a company that owns their data is um, theoretically you have more visibility into how your data is generated. Um, for this example, I have a lot of opaqueness, so I'm not clear on how this data was exactly generated. According to this site I took it from, um, it utilizes public information compiled from the Airbnb website, including the availability calendar for 365 days in the future, and reviews for each listing. Um, this isn't associated with Airbnb at all. I had to write this. Um, so this is just some, one person just was really gung-ho about ingesting um, data through Airbnb's API or whatnot. Um, and so I have no idea like what the quality of this is. I don't know what the quality of what Airbnb puts out um, publicly through their API, et cetera. And this is pretty important because it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, and this is incredibly important before you even start a task. Honestly, I'd say the majority of the work before doing a data modeling task is ensuring the data is reliable, correct, and um, stable over time. Um, so I'm going to assume all of these things are true, but I really don't know for this data. Um, so is the data clean or dirty? Is additional processing necessary? Um, as far as I know, this data was verified, cleansed, analyzed, and aggregated by someone. I don't know how it was pre-processed. 
Um, and the author doesn't know if there was additional pre-processing done by Airbnb before releasing their public data. So there could be several layers of assumptions that were made in how this data was processed um, that I have no visibility to as an end user. Um, but in terms of things that I can control or know, um, I looked at some basic things for additional processing necessary. Um, we'll see in the data it's just simple things like, are there nulls in between my data? Do I need to impute or interpolate some values for things? Um, yes, there are a lack of entries or rows for some dates. Um, what are the data types or units? Um, with time series data, this is incredibly important. Am I looking at nanoseconds, milliseconds, minutes, hours, dates? Um, and there's going to be a lot of processing um, with looking at time series data, specifically on timestamp information and how you um, store and aggregate that. Um, it appears these are date types or text types or string types, so the units appear okay. Um, and where do I store my data and how do I access it? Um, this aspect can be quite time intensive if your data is large and or not in a state to be ingested by Python. This is going to be a very simple example of a univariate, meaning one feature or time series data, but oftentimes people are thinking of really complex things like um, str stream data of your Fitbit data or something that could aggregate to very large amounts over time um, and be quite multidimensional and quite large. And where you store this and how you access this through your work um, can actually require a bit of legwork if you don't already have the infrastructure in place. In fact, this may take the majority of your time when you're performing a modeling or machine learning task is getting and reading in the data, cleaning it, making sure it's being ingested correctly, verifying it's being logged correctly, um, and having this sort of monitoring done over time. So a lot of work at um, Pinterest for the machine learning engineers and data scientists is pretty heavily on, I'd say, the data engineering part, which this includes. Um, for this specific data, um, it's relatively small. Um, so it will just be a 23 megabyte CSV file. So most single clusters or machines that you have should be able to handle this size data. Um, we don't need to sample in this case, but oftentimes with time series data, you are making a trade-off and you're making a question of sampling. Um, and there's a lot of different sampling methods um, that I won't go into, but how you sample it could also be biased in representing the distribution of your data. Um, can I load it all into memory on a single machine? In this case, yes. Um, so now we're going to take a couple of minutes and let you download the data. Um, you if you have 23 megabytes available on your machine, that's necessary. Um, if you don't, you need to clear out some stuff on your machine. <laughs> um, so um, if you can download the data, if you go to this link, um, it's called insideairbnb.com slash getthedata.html. It will have um, a section. I chose the Los Angeles section because we're in LA. You can feel free to choose others, but my example will be the Los Angeles section. So if you just search Los Angeles, um, and you search for the reviews.csv file um, and download it. Um, it won't be the first CSV file, but it should be present in there. Um, I'll give everyone like one or two minutes to try and do that. Um, and please let me know if you're having any difficulty downloading the data. Um, cool. I'll assume that you guys will either have finished this or you're continuing to do this. Um, I'm going to keep moving on. Um, if you need to see this again or you're having any difficulties, stop me and we can revert back. Um, so for the rest of this tutorial, I'm just going to go straight to the IPython notebook that I created and I will point you to it. Um, but that, it's just easier to see me running the code and you running the code and see what happens. Um, so the second task is to um, download the IPython notebook. So there's two options for this. Um, 
But my preferred method is in Collaboratory, which is an open source um, Google environment that's sort of like Google Docs for IPython notebooks. Um, so if you try opening this Google Drive link below, um, and you say, go to File and save a copy in your drive, in your Google Drive, um, you can save a copy of my IPython notebook. If you don't prefer this and you want to work in your own IPython or Python environment, I also have a GitHub repo that I'll show in a second. Does anyone still need to see this on this link on the screen? Okay, I'll wait another minute. Is anyone having difficulty downloading either the data or the IPython notebook? Cool, glad it's so easy. Um, awesome, then I'm gonna move to the next slide. Um, is everyone ready to see the GitHub repo? Cool. Um, so if you don't like Google and you want to do it in your own environment, um, I also have the IPython notebook at my GitHub repo. Um, I'm TK Louie. It's under the repo PyDataLA 2018. And the only thing in there is an IPython notebook that you can clone or download um, for yourself. Um, I, I'd recommend using Collaboratory just because ideally we'll have the same environment set up. Um, I believe this is being run in a Python 3 environment. Um, so um, it will just make it easier. You may run into errors with what packages you have installed and which versions. Um, but feel free to use this if you prefer. Cool. Cool. So is anyone still stuck on downloading the IPython notebook or the data still? Or just it hasn't downloaded yet? OK, cool. I'm going to keep going on then. Um, so let's open the IPython notebook and proceed. Um, I'll also add in the relevant notes from the IPython notebook into sections in this presentation. But we're going to switch to the Python notebook now. Um, so was everyone able to copy th this to their own drive or run cells on their own? Um, so um, to run a cell, you can either do shift enter or you can um, run the cell, which I'm sure there's a button here. Um, so it's, it's like any other IPython notebook. So each cell is runnable, stores that information. So the first thing we're going to do, which will take a couple of minutes, is read in our data. Um, so once you've downloaded the data from the CSV file, um, if you press this button or you do shift enter, um, it should pop up with something that says choose files. Um, and so when you choose files, you can choose um, wherever you've stored your reviews.csv file. Um, and it will start loading in. Um, it takes a couple of minutes to load it. Um, Google like, has set up this whole like, environment so that you can interface with Google Cloud or like Google um, like, formed data, big data. Um, services, um, but we're just going to upload a small CSV file, which will take a couple of minutes. So um, if you all want to just run this, and it's going to take probably a couple of minutes for everyone to load up their data. Um, and I'll just sort of keep talking while that's occurring. Um, so next um, is we're going to import some relevant packages. Um, everyone has their own preference for how cleanly to load in packages, whether to uh, load in unnecessary ones. Um, I'm not the cleanest um, writer in that sense, so I tend to import a sort of standard set of things that I use daily. And those typically include NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib. I do some things with um, displaying things, um, which I prefer. Um, Seaborn, we're actually not using, so that's sort of bad practice to have it in here, but I use it. Um, and date time is important. 
Um, and then I just set some options for pandas so that if I have um, a very large data set, I limit it to 100 columns and 100 rows. Um, and I'm just going to read in this CSV file that's loaded somewhere in a Google machine somewhere um, once this guy has finished uploading. So once you see that it is 100% uploaded, um, you can run the next cell. Um, and it should finish sort of similarly to how any IPython notebook finishes. Um, and once again, please feel free to stop me if um, anything's not working. Um, so let's look at what this data looks like. Um, so I have a bunch of questions in here I always like to ask. How many rows are there? How many columns are there? What are the data types? Very important. Is the data complete? Are there nulls? Um, do we have to infer values? What are the definitions of these columns? Are there any other caveats? Um, so for this data, um, it looks like it is just two columns. Um, it has listing ID and date. Um, so I'm assuming a listing ID is an Airbnb house or listing, um, and date is a given date. Um, it looks like this is 1.2 million rows by two columns. So not that big, not that small. Um, the types, um, so I just tend to just sort of print out everything. Um, the types are, um, the listing ID is an int64, and the date is an object. So we're likely going to have to change the date to a date time object at some point. Um, and this is just testing if there are nulls. Um, so there's no nulls. Um, there may be gaps between the dates, but there are no null values um, in our data, which is very unusual. Um, so we're, it's nice in this case, but most of the data I work with has nulls. Um, the data is not formatted cleanly, et cetera. Um, and I sort of print out descriptive statistics, but in this case it doesn't really make sense because listing ID is just a unique identifier, so it, this doesn't really tell us anything. But if I had a bunch of different numeric values, I might want to quickly have some descriptive statistics on what my data looks like. So um, has every or I should rephrase it, Has, are people still unable to load their data or have run into errors thus far? Um, so what's the error message saying? Maximum, maximum range exceeded? Oh, it's a call stack issue. Hmm. Um, so I'm going to call for collective knowledge from the audience um, for debugging. So with these things, I would either like Google this myself and look at Stack Overflow, or I'd ask someone. Um, let's see. As we're going through this, um, since this, this is a pretty important step, um, I feel like we should take like a minute or two and try to debug this. Um, so has anyone like able to successfully run it or has any ideas what might be going on right now? <laughs> locally it's running. They run it on the local um, like Jupyter node. Mm -hmm. if they start running from the second spot because you're using the local locally. Okay. So um, if you're doing this locally in your own Jupyter environment, um, I recommend a Python three notebook environment or a Python three kernel. Um, then skip the Google section completely. Um, sorry, that should have been something I said. So if you're, not, um, if you're not implementing this in Google Collaboratory and you're implementing it locally, this section is completely unnecessary. You can just read in a CSV file as you normally do. Cool. Um, OK. So are folks OK so far? Are folks still having issues? Um, I believe this is developed in a Python 3 kernel, so if you can use Python 3, any Python 3 version. Okay. Um, cool. So at this point, we've read in our packages, we've read in our CSV file. Um, these are pretty standard for small data. Um, for like larger data sets or industry, you, like you'll have some custom database connectors to a database you have set up somewhere. Um, so this step will take a lot more time, usually, um, meaning like setting it up. 
But in this case, we're just reading it in, which is nice. Um, so um, we've sort of seen our data. Um, so I thought, what, what can I possibly answer with this data? Um, usually I flip it the other way and start with the question and go with the answer, but I flipped it this time. Um, so at this point, theoretically, I had a question, like I want to say something about Airbnb time series data. Um, I've seen my data, and it's quite limited. So at this point, I'm saying I should probably expand or reduce the scope of my project and typically reduce it um, based on this data. Um, so this is really a good time to revisit what the original question you are. If you have a client or if you have a team member you're pitching this to, you may have had a really grand idea for your project, but looking at the data, you might have to scope it down to something much more concrete. Um, so, so given this data, um, one thing that I thought we could create that's very simple is a daily count of reviews for given listing IDs for given dates. So um, like how many listings are there um, on Airbnb at a given date um, every day. So some questions I could try to answer is forecast the future number of listing IDs or reviews for the Los Angeles area. Or I could forecast the future number of reviews for a specific listing in the LA area. Um, Maybe these things are incredibly important to Airbnb. Maybe they want to know what their supply of listings or reviews looks like in every market. Um, so this could be an interesting question that could be answered with time series data. And I think as we'll see very quickly, the time series data looks very different over time. Um, in terms of what techniques or models can be used to answer time series questions, um, these are just sort of a list of ones that I had in my head um, that I think of when I think of time series modeling. Um, so I come from more of a statistical background, so I started with statistical models. Um, so the first thing you could do is just ignore the time series aspect completely and do modeling using traditional um, statistical models, um, such as regression-based models. And one reason that might not be a great idea is you're not really leveraging the time series aspect. There's inherent order and structure in that data, and you're just ignoring that completely, um, which in modeling, you want to leverage as much information as possible. And so really, the downside of using, I'd say, traditional machine learning or statistical models in this is you're just not utilizing all of the data available. Um, some of the very classic. Um, time series modeling and statistics is very simple univariate um, time series modeling, and that's what we're going to be going through a lot today. So things you've probably heard of are um, averaging and smoothing models, ARIMA models. Um, so we're going to, be go going to be going through an example of one of those in this example today. Um, some slight modifications you can do to this are there are packages and developers working on adding external regressors to univariate models, um, creating multivariate models. Um, so there's like several different iterations you could do. Basically, anything you think of in a classic statistical modeling exercise, you can think of trying to modify um, for a time series question. Um, some other things that we'll see are additive or component models. Um, so Facebook came out with an open source package called Profit last year, which does very easy out of the box time series modeling, which um, is very useful um, for like, getting a very quick estimate of a future forecast. Um, and lastly, for statistical modelings I thought of are structural time series modeling. Um, so some things I've encountered in my work are Bayesian structural time series modeling, um, where say you have to create not just one forecast model, but you have to create sort of a series of forecast models, some of which are facing the cold start problem, meaning they have very little data, and some are very mature, um, and they have like much more data available. Um, an example of this I had at Twitter is like every time you enter a new market or you have a new product, you have extremely little time series data. And so you think, how can I leverage previous markets or previous products um, by using Bayesian priors um, to infer and better have a um, robust forecast for this model with very little data? Um, also, hierarchical time series modeling sort of falls into this context. Um, sometimes you may have an idea of, say, like a global figure, but maybe you're interested in a regional figure or something just for the LA area, but the data is not available or it's much smaller. So can we use um, Bayesian priors at, say, the global level to use that to infer um, at much more granular levels? Um, in terms of machine learning models, um, we can go through sort of a similar set of processes. So you can ignore um, the time series aspect completely and just um, use any machine learning model you want. 
Once again, the same um, caveats apply that you're not leveraging your signal as much as you can, in my opinion. Um, there's a bunch of machine learning models. I'm sure you guys have heard of some of them. Um, some of the ones I learned um, when I was in school are like not as much the neural network based ones, but support vector machines, random forest, gradient boosted decision trees. Um, a lot of these um, are common in industry, um, and so they're not bad places to start, to be honest, um, when you're trying to implement a machine learning model um, for like V0 or V1. Um, moving, um, typically the progression we've had with a lot of our models at Pinterest, which are not time series models, is we often started off with a simple linear or logistic regression model. Um, we then moved to sort of like a scalable distributed gradient boosted decision trees. Um, and then we finally moved to neural networks. So you'll see in a lot of um, industry examples, a lot of them started off sort of very simply and then um, transitioned to more complex models as they went on. Some of those reasons are easier to implement and distribute um, model training and deployment. Some are um, just easier to implement and quicker to implement. Um, and some was that just like these packages weren't available several years ago when the company was starting. Um, some, so um, you can look at traditional time series models. Some more time series specific ones are things like hidden Markov models, other sequence based models, um, Gaussian processes is quite common. Um, and then the most common neural network based model that's used for time series analysis are recurrent neural networks. And I'll go into a very like high level overview of how you apply neural networks to time series data. Um, and sort of the last thing that um, I think about before choosing a model is sort of whether or not to incorporate external data, um, keep it univariate or multivariate, um, outlier detection and removal, missing value imputation, um, just sort of standard things I tend to go on before I do modeling. Um, so I've talked for a really long time, so let's finally look at some time series data. Um, so the first thing I did, um, and I always do, is process it. Um, and so I'm doing a bunch of things here, but the main thing I'm doing is taking it from listing ID um, date to just a count of all of the listing IDs for a given date. Um, so we have one nice univariate time series that's much smaller that we can work with. Um, there's a bunch of other date and time things I have to do here, um, like change my um, date column to date time. I have to set it as a daily frequency. Um, a lot of these time series models are on sort of daily occurrences. So if you want to implement weekly, monthly, or even shorter time series models, um, you have to think about um, are these models set up for those um, and just impute things. <coughs> so um, once I ran this, um, you see the data goes through um, September 8th of this year. Um, this looks like there's probably some data missing but we'll deal with that. Um, for the seventh, it looks like there are 408 listing IDs for that given date. Um, and so we have our time series, which we're gonna work with for modeling. Um, so next, um, after I've uh, looked at the data briefly and cleaned it, I'm gonna plot it. Um, and this is very simple. You can just plot it um, similarly to how you do anything in Matplotlib. Um, so when I plot my data, um, we'll see that there does appear to be an overall increasing trend. Um, there appear to be some differences in variance over time. Um, there may be some seasonality or cycles in our data, and I'm not sure about outliers. Um, so if we look at this, um, this is not really a classic looking time series. Um, what we like to see are like really nice constant cycles of things, almost looking like a sinusoid of some sort. Here we've got sort of almost exponential growth, um, the variance is sort of changing wildly over time. Um, so there's a lot of things that we're going to have to do to this data um, to make it appropriate for time series modeling. Um, and specifically, um, that term that's used often for time series modeling is stationary. Um, so most of the time series models um, that you'll see assume that the underlying data is stationary. And this gives us some nice statistical properties about that allows us to use these models for forecasting. Um, stationary basically means that there's constant mean variance and autocovariance doesn't depend on time. Or more simply put, um, if you're trying to use past data to predict future events, we should assume that the data will follow the same general time trends and patterns as in the past. Um, this general statement holds for most training data and modeling tasks. 
Um, so a lot of the tech companies where the underlying process of generating the data changes every year, um, these assumptions don't hold true. And so even correcting for these things, um, we really sort of call into question, like, is this truly representing our data um, if we make our data and transform it such that it's stationary? Um, there's some good diagrams and explanations on stationarity that I included um, that make it a little more intuitive. Um, so sometimes we need to make the data stationary, and in this case we do. Um, however, like I mentioned, this transformation calls into question whether this data truly is stationary, if we can really use past data to predict future data, um, if we believe the underlying way our data is generated has changed. Um, in terms of some basic things that we look at to say, is this data stationary not, or not, um, one is using the Dickey-Fuller test. Um, so I implemented a um, simple version of it that I took from here. Um, so the Dickey-Fuller test, um, the null hypothesis is that it is not stationary, which is very confusing. Um, so we're trying to reject that to say that it is stationary. Um, so when I run um, just the function I did to output the statistical test itself as well as the, um, like a graph of what this looks like, um, so we see for our data, um, the original is in blue. Um, the rolling mean, just sort of like the average at each um, time point, averaged over some amount of time points, increases over time, and that's in red. And the standard deviation is also increasing over time. So um, I would think that this would mean that our data is not stationary. Um, and if I look at the output of the Dickey-Fuller test for the p-value, um, I get 0.3. This means that we fail to reject the null hypothesis at 0.05 level, which means that we can't say that it is stationary. Um, so we need to do some transformations or changes to our data in order to make this data stationary and appropriate for modeling. Um, so some common ways to correct for stationarity are to, de you'll hear detrending and deseasonalizing it, meaning that the mean um, will become constant over time and the variance will become constant over time. Um, statistically wise, like what happens if you don't do any of these things? Um, variance of your models can be misspecified. The model fit can be worse. And once again, you're not really leveraging the time uh, dependent nature of the data. Um, so it will just be a worse model fit, um, which I think like as we're endeavoring to create the best model possible, ideally we want to correct for these things. Um, and I have some more on the pitfalls of um, like implementing things without thinking of the time series aspect in these links. Um, so in terms of what we actually do to the data, um, so there's some things we can do such as transformation. So oftentimes we'll take the log, the square root, or some uh, simple transformation to make our trend more stationary. We're going to look at the log. Um, we can do things like smoothing our data to make it less um, cyclical and a little more smooth. So um, things like weekly average, monthly rolling averages. Um, we can do differencing, and differencing actually makes a big difference in um, looking at um, making a signal more stable because we're not actually looking at the time series itself. We're actually taking the difference between time t plus 1 and time t, and that actually those differences theoretically should be more stable over time. Um, or you can do other things like polynomial fitting or decomposition, and we'll see an example of what decomposition means. Um, in terms of transformation, smoothing, and differencing, um, there's like a lot of different trans... So this sort of takes a lot of time. And as we see, this is going to run for a while. Um, so, um, yeah. So um, what we're going to see here is um, I created a data frame which does a lot of these different things. So... Um, yeah, actually, I'll just go down to the columns. Um, so things I did for our time series data, which is just a date, and then time series, which is TSs. I took the log. I took a moving average of the log. Um, I did sort of all of these different combinations and tested them um, to see if they're stationary. Um, and I'll let you guys sort of run it and go through it later. But some examples of what um, it will look like um, are like, for instance, here is like the original time series, and here is the logged version, which um, at least trend-wise is not changing as much. Um, 
and we'll sort of see like the log version and the moving average log version looks fairly similar, so we're not adding that much additional um, stability to our data. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I think for um, time series forecasting, there's a lot of art in it, unfortunately, which means it's not very, um, like, the expected outcome is not the same every time. Um, what I tend to do is I tend to run the Dickey Fuller test for each of these um, new time series and see if that is stationary. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I, in my experience, have just tried a lot of these things. And with intuition with my data, Maybe I can narrow that space down to a finite set of transformations um, if I've done this in the past. Um, so if you're working with the same time series data over and over again, um, you'll tend to believe that um, the same transformations will yield similar um, results. Um, so um, I plotted a bunch of them. Um, and so what I was specifically saying is I output the Dickey Fuller test for all of them. Um, so I looked through these, and I have sort of like which time series it's applying to. Um, and so I'll let you guys look through all of these, but um, at a high level, um, when I looked through it, um, it appeared for this data that log transformation, weekly mover, moving average smoothing and differencing all made the data more stationary over time based on the Dickey-Fuller test. Um, we would claim that we reject the null hypothesis um, and say that the data is stationary. So I believe for modeling going forward, I used one or more of these um, to model my data, and I claim that my data is stationary so that the statistical assumptions underlying these models are satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. So, for instance, if we look at the original one, um, so the three things I mentioned for stationarity are. Is there a trend line I can fit? Um, so there appears like there's a trend line that's not constant, meaning not flat. Um, is the standard deviation constant, meaning is the um, sort of like width we're seeing or the oscillations over time staying constant? It appears that's not the case in the original time series. And I can't really see autocorrelation here, but I would like do like an ACF or autocorrelation plot. Um, whereas if we start to look at um, Things like, um, like the logged version and the moving average log version, I would say at least um, with the exception of some outliers, the variance appears like it is becoming more constant, meaning that the fluctuations aren't as high. Um, the trend doesn't appear to be, so maybe I would need to um, do a differencing. Um, so I'll keep going through some examples to see if I can show an example. So here is the logged version and the logged diffed version, meaning I first took the log of the time series data, and then I um, did the difference between the next time point and the current time point. And that looks pretty stable over time. Um, this, the trend looks pretty flat. With the exception of some outliers, the variance appears to be flat. So I would probably feel comfortable using the version with logging the data and taking the differences. Um, and I would say that um, indicates to me that they might be stationary. Um, and I confirmed that with the Dickey-Fuller test. Um, sorry, is there a question? Um, does a runtime error influence the graphs? Yeah, so let's see what this runtime error says. Invalid value encountered in subtract out array. Um, so typically, if it's a runtime warning, it is a warning. Um, ideally, that means that like the code was not implemented correctly, and there's probably a better way to do this. In this case, a lot of the things that I run into are um, like when you're slicing data from a data frame, um, using dot loc is recommended. So for most of my data, I transitioned it to using the location rather than purely slicing. And this has issues with how it assigns copies of data frames. Um, so this is just like not good practice for this piece of data. But um, it should run still um, sufficiently. Um, does anyone else have questions before we keep going? Did you mention this earlier, but what are your strategies for computing missing data? 
Yeah, I didn't talk about missing data at all. Um, but if um, you think about it, almost all of your data you're going to encounter has missing data. Um, so in biostatistics, there's topics of like missing completely at random, missing at random, not missing at random. So um, if you believe that the data that you um, are not observing was missing completely at random, that means that you can um, infer um, either a random value like um, a zero, the mean, or whatnot. Um, or you can just drop it and assume that your data is representative of your whole set. If you think there's some bias in what's missing and what's not, for instance, um, for us, if we're thinking about users, like data that we don't have from users, we assume are less engaged users. And so that's biased in the type of data we observe and don't observe. Um, so there aren't really great strategies I have. I would say I tend to think about um, sort of like these situations, which are, do I think my data is missing at random, or do I think it's not missing at random? Um, if it's um, missing at random, um, then you can look to your current data and infer values. So if you believe that the distribution of your data represents it, you can use um, like the median or the mean, or if you believe it represents a zero. In this case, like for instance, if a date was missing a data, I would infer it's a zero, because I just assume we had no listings on that date. Um, if I believe that it's biased, um, then I have to think some more, um, because then we're not capturing our data, and I'm not sure what it should represent. Would you, would you calculate the mean across all time or within a century? Yeah, so that's a great point. So you could actually infer from points before and after. You could do rolling means or rolling averages, because oftentimes, for instance, for this data, um, like if you sam the, the mean might be more heavily influenced by 2018, 2019, 2017, um, when really I'm imputing data mostly for, say, 2011, 2012. So it wouldn't really be fair to just impute the overall mean. Um, so you could impute it from surrounding values. Um, oftentimes, we think that time series has correlation, especially in near term. So in near time, they tend to be quite correlated. So you could impute it from pre like the average between the previous and next data point. Uh, similar question, but what if you just have irregular data? Yeah, so there's a lot of questions about, um, say that I had extremely sparse data at the beginning and I had increasing frequency over time. Um, if you believe that's a function of the fact that like Airbnb gained popularity and was gaining traffic, that's biased um, in how um, your data is being generated. So I would say that like, when you're first setting up your data pipelines, it's extremely important to ideally like, regularly set it up and not plan just for the next like, one month, but the next one year or two years. Um, because setting up these pipelines early on will pay off in a really long term. Um, so like a lot of long running experiments are things we try to do. We try to set up um, to sample as much as possible. I would say if you have the capacity um, over um, over measure versus under measure. Um, but there's not really a great way. At that point, I would say that um, like when we typically set up experiments, we like to ensure that we sample um, at s similar intervals. Otherwise, there's bias, and we can't estimate what that bias is. Um, does anyone else have questions about anything I've talked about? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. said, now, why, well, why would you necessarily want to do that? Is it like, you know, with marketing seasonality, it's going to be a big predictor. Yeah, so from, from the business standpoint, you do not want to because, they're like, for example, for Amazon, Black Friday and Christmas are the biggest times of the year. But from a statistical modeling perspective, I want to fit to what essentially looks like noise at the end. I want my residuals to look like noise. Um, and seasonality yeah. is um, is not something that statistically we want to fit to. Um, so ideally, you want to strip your signal of anything that does not look either if you believe it's a linear relationship or a non-linear relationship. Um, like you want to try to preserve that relationship as much as possible. Um, so an example I had at Twitter is a lot of our data is highly seasonal at Twitter. Um, so things like the holidays, the elections, big events um, are hugely impactful on our data. So we would see things like, um, for instance, these spikes you see um, are huge in our data. And that could be huge, um, have huge leverage or influence on the overall fit of our model. 
So for instance, if we had extreme outliers on um, Black Friday, um, that could completely throw off the error metrics for our model. So we would typically have to impute information for, say, holidays or Black Friday. Um, because um, if you're predicting overall, say, profitability for Twitter, that you are like that seasonality is going to impact. Yeah. Yeah. So some. Like you're destroying data. Yeah. So some things you can add in addition are specific um, binary um, features just for that date. Mm -hmm. um, so you might have like a zero one variable for a holiday or for something. Um, so those are types of things that we would add in. Um, but you can't do that for every single um, seasonal event. Like um, Black Friday through Christmas occurs for six weeks or five weeks. Um, so we can't have like a single binary feature for every one of those days. But yeah, I agree that seasonality is actually incredibly important. And if your overall goal is to capture fully the outliers, then we have to think a little bit more about like incorporating outlier features. If your goal is to just reliably estimate on average how this signal performs, you ideally want to strip away as much signal as possible. Cool. Any other questions? OK. Um, I'll keep going then. So um, the last thing I'm going to show is um, decomposition for things like seasonality, um, trend, and residuals. Um, so when we say this, um, like another way of instead of doing all of these complicated transformations, there's a lot of rel readily available packages and things that will do detrending and deseasonalizing for you. Um, so I'll show one example of those packages. So here we have in the top left our original time series. Um, and then we are able to decompose it. And this is really good for just visual purposes of what your time series data looks like, is we can see the trend in the top right. Um, we can see what the seasonality looks like on an annual basis in here. So there is some sort of annual seasonality to this data. Um, and we're able to see what the residuals look like in the bottom right at the very end, which looks like noise, which for us is actually really good because that's much better to fit. There are still some outliers there that I would probably want to investigate more if I had more time. Um, and so I did the Dickey Fuller test once again on the residuals for this. Um, and um, we were able to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that we believe it's stationary data. Um, so I've talked for a really long time and I haven't gotten to modeling. So we're going to do some modeling finally. Um, so we're going to start with ARIMA models. Um, so ARIMA models are a very classic statistical time series model. Um, it stands for Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average Models. Um, and that really decomposes into three parts. Um, so the model is a function of three main types of terms. One is the number of autoregressive terms. And an autoregressive term is just if you plot the time point um, at the current time and the time point at the previous time point. Um, what does it look like? And we sort of fit a line to that. Um, and you can do that for um, like a second order autoregressive term, et cetera. Um, the integrated part is the number of difference terms. So I talked about taking the difference of time t and time, say, t minus 1. Um, you can actually do this several times over to make your data more and more stationary. And lastly is the number of moving average terms. Um, and this is actually looking at is there any relationship in the remaining error or the remaining residuals. Um, and so these um, uh, arguments are usually coded as P, D, and Q um, in a lot of ARIMA models you'll see. Um, and these are ones that we mainly use to control um, which ARIMA model we want to use. Um, so how do we determine these P, D, and Q parameters? We use what's called autocorrelation functions and partial autocorrelation functions. So these are plots that look at what is the correlation between the current time um, and lagged times previously. Um, and partial autocorrelation is how much additional information is provided by each successive lagged term. Um, so there's some like sort of general rules of thumb um, to determine P and Q, which is just the lag value where the PACF plot crosses the upper confidence bound and for Q where the ACF chart does the same. Um, so what that looks like, um, in actuality um, is this is an example of what a autocorrelation and a partial autocorrelation plot could look like. Um, here I'm using transform data, so I'm using the logged diffed data. Um, and we see here that um, if you follow sort of this line, um, we see it crosses the upper confidence bound 
at 2, um, which is a little hard to see. And it doesn't really cross it for um, the partial autocorrelation plot. Um, so if we went back up to sort of like our rules of thumb, um, then we would say that um, we might need um, a Q, like a Q term. We might not need a P term, um, where a Q term is a moving average term and a P term is an autoaggressive term. Um, so what we'll see this actually means for fitting in a REMA model is um, I just have um, a simple stats model package which imports um, a time series analysis in a REMA model. Um, and it will output things like root mean square error and residual sum of squares, although there's lots of er other error metrics we can use. Um, so I ran three different examples. Um, so the three different examples I use, um, if we refer back to the PDQ arguments, um, are 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, 1. Um, and this is how you'll sort of commonly see them written, is something like a REMA and then in parentheses its arguments. Um, I would expect that the, um, the second or the third one should have better fit um, because our plots indicated that our PACF and ACF plots indicated we probably need some moving average terms but not some autoregressive terms. Um, and so I sort of plotted them out um, and they all have relatively decent fit to our data which looks sort of noisy. Um, if I look at just say like the root mean square error, I would say that the second and third model perform better. Um, so I would likely proceed with one of those models, um, but I would probably keep iterating to see if I could make this as low as possible by trying out many other iterations of this. Um, and you could write a function that just simply runs through like all potential combinations of these and just minimizes on root mean square error or mean absolute error or whatever um, error term you're trying to minimize. Sorry, can you say that one more time? Yes, so if you'll look specifically, um, so this is a little bit of a tricky thing. You can either apply the differencing um, for the input data or you can apply the differencing in the ARIMA model itself. So there's already a diff of one technically in all of this data because it's difference data. Yeah, so I mean, since we're already taking it, then this is easy. Right, so it's very rare that you'll need to difference things twice, meaning taking difference of differences. Um, so yeah, in this case, I didn't think it was necessary to have another differencing term. Yep. Conceptually, uh, when, we, when we figure data, mm -hmm. trying to do a really follow a trend across, mm -hmm. you know, a knowledge component. Yep. Uh, that intuitively will tell me that what I'm really looking for is a range of values for the point that I'm trying to predict as opposed to a specific value. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is there a, a slightly different way of thinking about it where you get like, you know, kind of like two lines or two plots? Yeah, yeah. So, some ways we thought about um, how do you create, I guess the way I would rephrase that is how can you create sort of error bounds or confidence around these estimates? So, ideally, what you would have is you would have your time series data, you would have a forecasted line, and then you would have error bounds or um, like intervals around those. Um, so we actually thought about that a lot, like how do you um, create error bounds on time series data? Um, if you're using classic statistical models, there are like error metrics you can potentially use. Other ways we thought of using are bootstrapping. Um, so if you sample from your time series data and you um, fit these models, you can get some est point estimates for what um, the value should be at a given point in time. Um, and you can create an interval based on that. Um, or like if like um, say it's like similar for um, like if you just have a normal distribution and you just have like some um, variance that you have that there there is comparable sort of variance standard variance metrics you could use for that for this model um, but the variance might be misspecified um, so it just depends on if you assume um, this explains your data adequately um, so those are two ways that I think about. Um, like uh, a distribution of values rather than just a single one. Um, you can also think about it that basically what this is doing is each of these terms, autoregressive and moving average specifically, is you're fitting a linear regression to um, two axes. One is like 
value y at time t and value um, at time t minus 1. And you're trying to fit that linear regression for that term. And you're just um, having all of these autoregressive terms and then doing the same thing for the error term, lagged error terms for a moving average. Um, so it's fitting a bunch of linear regression models, essentially. Um, and we're trying to combine these all into one final output. Yeah, I'll try to explain that better next time. Um, um, some other time series models that we'll get to look at that I like are Facebook Profit. Um, so this came out after I left Twitter, which is really unfortunate because it's a super easy way to do time series forecasting. Um, this uses a slightly different statistical form of a time series model, which are component models or additive models. So this can allow you to estimate day of week effects, day of year effects, actually time of day effects too. Um, holiday effects, trend trajectory, and can do MCMC sampling, which is another way you can create error bounds. Um, so this might take a while to import everything. But here I'm importing um, PyStan and then Facebook Profit, um, which are necessary to run this. And what it's going to actually create is a really nice um, forecast um, that I'm going to just show below um, for correctness. So this is the actual original time series, not I didn't have to do any transformation work or anything. Um, the dots are the actual data, I believe, and then the blue line is the forecast through the end of 2018. Um, so you'll see our data sort of stops around September of 2018, and the blue goes to the end, and it applies some standard 95 or 80 percent confidence intervals around them in the shaded blue. Um, so this is actually a really easy um, way to visualize an output forecast for time series data. If you have a lot of, um, I'd say, like analyst or business partners that aren't as familiar with time series, or you just want to try it really easily yourself, um, I highly recommend starting with Facebook Profit um, because not only does it output the time series, but it also outputs some nice graphs on the trend component, the um, yearly seasonal component, um, so we can see very clearly effects by time of year. Um, we don't have time of day effects in here because it's daily data. Um, and then also day of week effects. And these are really nice intuitive things that you can bring to people and say, we see some effects for Sunday or we see some effects for December. Um, so this is actually a really nice um, model that I like to use for simple forecasting needs. Um, and so um, this is going to keep loading. But basically, um, what I'm doing is I have a bunch of inputs. Um, and you can customize any of these. You can change the trend line you're estimating. You can change um, the confidence bounds and how you sample them, a ton of things. Um, and I think one really valuable one that I don't include is you can include priors. Um, I don't include um, holidays, but actually in a lot of your data, you'll have outliers, and you can actually fit those, um, and it will output something. Um, so that's actually really nice to estimate the effect of a single day or a single time series point. Um, so I do all of this. Um, I'm going to keep going. Um, let's see. This guy fin so this guy finished. So I'm just going to run a couple more cells just so I can get through these. Um, and I just want to see what my error metrics look like. Um, so I also, um, like whenever you're evaluating your time series data, Thinking about your evaluation metric is actually pretty important. Um, so here, I printed out some standard ones for continuous value um, models. Um, but you also have to think about um, like when training and testing. Um, like say you train from like 2011 to 2014 and you're predicting 2015. Um, you have to think about um, like if you truly randomly sample your data and um, like 70% is for training and 30% is for testing. Um, is that really representative of your data? Are you missing a lot of the time series components that you need when you're actually going to be deploying this in production? Um, so typically what we do is we do um, sort of like moving window testing. So we'll test from, say, like 2011 to 2014 and predict 2015. We'll add in 2015 and predict 2016. And we'll continue doing this to get a set of error metrics um, that we can evaluate. We tend to not just sort of randomly sample um, from our data because we're missing some essential time series um, correlations in our data. Um, so yeah, thinking about error metrics is another area I can talk about. 
Um, and then lastly is, um, I wish I had more machine learning models to give for you. This is going to be the only one I present. Um, so this one is called LSTM for regression. Um, and so LSTM is based on a recurrent neural network model, and it stands for long short-term memory networks. So I'm actually going to go quickly back to my slides, because um, I was like, how am I going to explain long short-term memory networks? Um, and so, and so um, this is like a huge simplification of it, but I'm going to try to go through it. Um, so you see on the graph on the bottom left, um, sort of a classic neural network. Um, you can really think of it at a simple state as you have a set of input nodes. You have some transformation, um, and you have a set of output nodes. And that transformation is usually um, bounded between either 0 and 1 or negative 1 and 1. There's one or more layers. There's one or more nodes within each layer. And you apply just um, like a tan H or like um, a softmax transformation to it. And um, that is passed through to the output. Um, and through a nice trick, through a backpropagation algorithm, we're able to compute a minimum or some minimum for optimization. Um, when you move to time series, um, we tend to think of a lot of things more like sequence models. So you move from one to many, one input to many outputs. So for instance, here, instead of just having one input to one output, um, you have um, an output, and that is actually used as information for the next time series point to predict. Um, it sort of keeps happening in sequence. Um, so this is a very simple example you could have for this is you can have um, the input is the data at time t, and the output is at time t plus 1, t plus 2, and t plus 3. Um, so this is what I did in some of my graduate work, is we actually only predicted, say, three steps or five steps into the future. Um, if you're trying to predict 100 steps into the future, there's a lot more uncertainty. Um, so for a lot of machine learning work, you can actually apply um, like pretty simple uh, machine learning models, but just change it such that your output is a matrix of the estimate at time t plus 1, t plus 2, t plus 3, et cetera. Um, so that's sort of like the idea basis for recurrent ne neural networks. Um, and so specifically for recurrent neural networks, we use the output from the uncertainty and the output from each new time point, and we feed that in to um, the time point after that. So you would take the estimate for y0, that would inform the estimate at y1, et cetera. And this is the recurrent nature of it, is that you're feeding information um, continuously into each successive new step in your neural network. Um, one issue with this, as you can see, is it only depends on the exact previous time point. So we're not able to incorporate longer term dependencies. Um, so it's I'm giving like a very poor explanation, but for long short-term memory networks, basically you can expand this to capture longer-term dependencies. So oftentimes your data might not be dependent just between time t and time t plus 1, or the previous week or the previous month. Maybe you have a 13-day lag for some reason. You need to capture all of the dependencies there. Um, so I'm not as much of an expert on recurrent neural networks and long short-term memory networks, but this is sort of a high-level overview um, of like a very like standard machine learning model specifically for time series analysis. Um, so if we go back to our slide, um, there's like a lot of stuff in how this um, long short-term memory network is created. Um, it sort of goes through sort of classic steps you would think of for a machine learning model. Um, create the data set, fix a random seed, just for this example. Get the data, you normalize it with some standard scalar. Um, you split it into training and testing. Um, you like transform the data. Um, and then you fit an LSTM um, network, and you can specify the number of layers, the number of nodes, et cetera. Um, this is just one example. Um, and then we're going to take a time step every time and see what this, um, what the estimate is after doing this for like five time steps, or 100 time steps, or 1,000 time steps. Uh, um, do you still do the differencing and make sure the data is stationary for all these 
ISP networks, or you let them already figure out what? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'd assume that if you transform the data, um, it would likely converge to whatever its minimum is more quickly, but that's like a sort of guess. Um, if you didn't, I can't, well, either way, I can't guarantee it would converge to the actual minimum of this. Um, if you ran this for a million time steps, maybe it would in either case. Um, I'm not sure about stationarity assumptions under machine learning models. I would personally apply them as well. Um, because it's very easy to reverse engineer a log and a difference. Um, it's much harder to say, like, this is not going to be sufficient to model, like, future changes because the data is not stationary. So I would personally transform the data first. Um, but I don't know specifically for this machine learning model how it handles um, because it applies a lot of nonlinear transformations to it. So theoretically, maybe the log aspect would be captured, but I can't say. Um, so um, I only ran this for five epochs because it takes a really long time. Um, and ideally, there's like some nice mathematical properties that would guarantee convergence if I ran this for long enough. Um, but um, for this, um, I ran it for t five time steps for a couple of different versions of LSTMs here. Um, and so um, I'll just show what a couple of those look like. Um, this also nice thing about collaboratory, and I swear I'm not being sponsored to say this, um, is there's like TensorFlow backends and things you can do. So if you want to implement um, sort of like any TensorFlow models, this is like a decent way to do it. Um, so we see that it ran for five epochs, and it sort of outputs some root mean square error on the training and test data. Um, and we can sort of see what those each look like visually. Um, and honestly, like, at the end of the day, I tend to just look at my data and say, like, do I think this is a decent fit and will estimate my data accurately in the future? Um, and it seems like it's a decent fit. I mean, there's a lot of um, nonlinear complexities that are incorporated in this neural network. Um, so it seems to be doing a decent job. I would personally compare this probably at the end to what I originally created. So I would probably create some ARIMA models. I would create some component models. I would create a couple different machine learning models and compare their, the same error metrics across all of them um, and see how they do, um, and see how they do across varying windows of future forecasted data um, before I would choose my final model. Um, so I did this for a bunch of them. Some fit better, fit worse. Um, but overall, I think that I just threw like a ton of information at you. There's a lot of really interesting things about time series data. I would say overall, I would just say like think really carefully about whether um, time series data is going to help you in your quest. Um, I would say that like try to think about like is the data that you're generating um, like biased in any way in how you're capturing time series points, and like how can I revert that bias when I'm modeling? Um, I would say that not just for time series data, but for all modeling in general. Um, and I would say before you jump to sort of neural network based time series models, I would encourage you to look at statistical time series models as well. Um, because you'd be surprised, like, these univariate, like, the univariate models is just you take a time series and you fit it um, with a statistical model, and it works decently well. And a lot of companies will sort of default to that um, before sort of moving on to neural network-based models. Um, one, for intuition, but two, because it works. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to explore sort of a suite of models and a suite of training and testing sets um, before you sort of choose your final model. Um, that's all I had for this tutorial. I'd be happy to take more questions or to debug anything with anyone. Um, and thanks for listening to me. Yes. Treating it as time series data doesn't work anymore. You know, like if you have two years of data, but you're sampling every six months, so you just bring it up. Yes. Like so. You just treat it as a categorical variable. And yes. So I actually come from a biostatistics background where you can only sample things whenever patients come in. Yeah. So that's only every three to six months. Mm -hmm. um, and you're typically only predicting like one metric at five years. Like 
uh, incidence of cancer at five years or something like that. Um, so in those cases, we would actually treat it as categorical features or just one continuous feature, and we would say, we're s our outcome is this um, rate or this feature at X years. So you can actually frame a lot of your statistical and machine learning problems by just stating the time that you select the final outcome. Um, also, I would say for time series data, you need at least four cycles of data to predict the next cycle. So a big issue we had at Twitter was um, we were trying to predict one the next year of revenue, and we only had about four to five years of revenue data at that point. Um, so it was very, the underlying data essentially changed, like the underlying product changed over time in the way the data was generated. So we didn't really have a stable time series. So I actually called into question like whether even doing these transformations was really accurate for our models. Because I would say like the product as we had it now only existed for like a year. So if you're trying to predict anything um, like for a lot of time points in the future, you need a lot of historical data. So this works generally well for like a lot of government-based data. So agriculture, finance, things that are relatively um, cyclical over time. For things that are a little faster paced, um, it's not always the right way to go. How, how come the training score is a lot smaller than the testing score? So um, if you think about it in your training data, you're trying to minimize something like the root mean square error, and your testing set is generally going to perform more poorly. Um, so in this case, I'm not surprised that the training root mean square error is much smaller than the testing. Um, and you'll find as you implement models into practice, oftentimes your testing data is much wor performs much worse. And so you're trying to minimize the difference, ideally, between your testing and your training difference. Exactly. Yeah. So if you think about as your variance increases over time, you're also going to increase your root mean square error if you don't account for the de trending, deseasonalizing, reducing the variance. Because your root mean square error is going to explode um, if you're trying to estimate something where the variance increases over time. Yep. So what is the unique selling point for the Facebook profit package? Is there anything special about it? Um, so, uh, I shouldn't probably talk about all of this, but like a lot of the features that um, they have already built into their package are things that like every data science forecasting team has tried to custom build in R or Python. Um, so specifically, the things that I would call out for Facebook profit um, are, actually I'm going to just show these graphs. Um, are these, um, so most packages will do detrending and sort of deseasonalizing. What I think is valuable are a couple ones. One is you can implement holidays. So most of us had to custom implement additional binary features. Like we had this additional data frame of binary holiday features that we had to add, and this will do it for you. Um, I would also add that you can try to create confidence bounds. We had to do a lot of um, back testing sampling methods, and there's sampling methods already built into Facebook Profit to create these, um, they're sort of shaded, but these error bounds. Um, like to create, create true confidence bounds, um, we try to use sampling methods, and that's already built in here. So I'd say those are like two of the main benefits I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what I did in my research is I actually um, did basically a machine learning model that predicted something like on the right. Um, and so um, all it was was the features were um, various features at different time points. So you could have like um, a thousand features that were feature one at time point t minus one, feature at time point t minus two, et cetera. Um, and you can do that same thing for all of the features. Um, and then you can just fit it um, if you have the data um, to like a single output, which is like, um, like at t time t plus one, or you can do it for like an aggregate something. So I just tend to think of it as you're like fitting some input features, which can just be the same feature um, sampled at different time points. Um, and then output features, which is like a time point in the future. Um, so you can sort of think of it, I tend to think of it in sort of like a regression-based manner that way, where you have inputs and outputs. 
Um, and you can feed in features that are the exact same thing, just measured at different time points. Um, in terms of the specific models I went over, um, there's specific packages or ways. Some packages have external regressor capabilities, some don't. Um, so I would just look into which ones do and which ones don't um, to implement them. Cool. Does anyone else have any other questions? Okay. If not, thank you so much for all of your time. Have a good time at PyData.